We've now got Ian and Hildy McNichol, who are going to talk about the clinical aspect. Um, Ian is also co-chair of the uh, Open Air Foundation. He's chief clinical information officer in Indus, and Hildy is the chief operating officer at Indus. So they're ideally placed to offer you the, the clinical aspect to Thomas's tech. As soon as we can get Ian suitably wired. I'm wired. <laughs> and Hildy is now visible by yeah. the magic so, of screen. Ian and Hildy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. We, who? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> we know the answer to that one, yeah. Yeah, so good almost afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Um, when, when we moved open air from its <coughs> somewhat academic environment, we were very clear that we wanted to have good representation from both sides, the clinical side and the technical side. And that's why we set up, deliberately set up this idea of co-chairs, Tomaj effectively representing the industry technical side, me representing the clinical side, a former GP, but involved in this kind of nerdy world for, for quite a long time. Getting to grips with what open air is about under the hood is quite a hard thing. And Dave Kilroy, who, who helped set this up, said to Hildy and I, just come and do half an hour and explain open EHR and, you know, it'll be fine. You know, do your usual stuff. We'll that. We can't do it. And we knew that Tamaj actually sets the scene really, really well. So we thought, let's do something different. Let's do a demo. <laughs> um, one should never do demos. Uh, we should never do them on the web, and we should never do them as a double act, but we're going to give it a go. So, first slide. Is Hildy's, demo? Hildy's driving. <laughs> no, no, yeah, this, this is the demo. This is it. This is good at guess. I think one of the things that people, that doesn't come across, is that this is an ecosystem, essentially, you know, we know it's for defining and storing and querying rich clinical data sets, but it's something we can do really fast. There's no engineering involved, right? So the story is, we, that being the clinicians, or more accurately, I think, clinical informaticians working with clinicians, build the models, and then we effectively throw them over the wall into these CDRs, and they just work. There's no database. Uh, reconfiguration. There are no logical models being built. We do the modelling and the systems consume that. It makes it really, really fast. So what we're going to try to do in the next 20-25 minutes is just to show you that end to end. All right? It will be a huge rush through. You'll go, what the heck is happening? But we will try to show this business of building some models, adapting some models, taking it through the process. And this afternoon, Hilde and I are both running workshops end to end, where she'll do much, a much more gentle run through some of the modeling hands-on, and then I'll take over the models that she's built and do a bit of a tech demo for those of you who want to understand a bit more about how the API works. Okay, next. Okay, so the example we're going to take is actually a very live example, and it's good, a good example of why this world is so difficult. Who's heard of reasonable adjustments? Yes, since Friday, yeah. Since Friday, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is literally hot off the press. Yeah, I'm, as well as um, my interopen duty, uh, my uh, open air duties, like Aid, I'm involved in the, the uh, interopen work. I'm a board member in interopen representing open EHR in the UK, but also at the call face with people at like Andy, actually helping build the profiles. And here's an example they said there is a thing called reasonable adjustment, it's part of equality legislation. It means that someone who's in uh, a, a, an employment environment or who rocks up at a hospital can say, look, I have these conditions or needs, usually something like learning disability or visual impairment. Can you make those reasonable adjustments to the working environment? It's something that we're going to have, like GDPR, it's, an, a, a, you know, it's part of legislation. The idea is to put it on the spine to flag up that a patient has those reasonable adjustments. But there is also a clear expectation that those of us who are building systems will have an equivalent repository of this reasonable adjustments thing. And in some ways, it's quite simple. It is just uh, presenting needs for reasonable adjustments. So I have a learning disability and I have sensory disability, and the potential adjustments are, you know, need a clear, quiet area to communicate, uh, I may need somebody to help me with explain instructions. So there's, there's simple requirements. But then this is real data. 
You know, this has to be properly medical, legally captured, it has to be audited, it has to be updated, then you get into all, all the fun and games. So anyway, we thought we'd use this as how do we, how do, we do this in open EHR? Um, next slide, Philly. This is the content, it's too small to read in the past, but basically zero to many reasons uh, for uh, reasons or pre presenting <coughs> conditions, things like autism, long-term conditions, mental health conditions, zero to many reasonable adjustments, which will be SNOMED coded, and then things like consent, and then the whole kind of provenance of, of this, you know, how it gets updated, okay? So what we're going to show you very quickly are a set of tools. Okay, These, this this tool is one that Miranda are just about to release. It's the archetype and template editor. We're currently mostly most of us are working with um, some older Windows-based tools to do this. They're kind of industry standard. But we thought we'd give this new product a bit of a, a fly out. So not only are we doing a double act, not only doing a demo, but we're using new tooling. What could possibly go wrong? Um, we'll, you'll see this flashback very quickly. This is. Um, the Mirand EHR Explorer. It fundamentally, it's a visualizer of the backend data store. It's in di designed for. It's not designed for end users. It's designed. It's a sort of you know what you use if you're manipulating SQL Server or something behind the scenes. So it's a technical tool. But you'll see the templates being loaded up into the CDR, into the backend engine, and then we can use some form building technology. Now form building isn't part of Open EHR. It's not part of the formal spec yet, but most companies who are involved in this space have some kind of form building or form hooking up technologies. And we can show you this in the sense we'll build the models, we'll upload them, we'll build the form, save some data, query some data, job done, lunch. Okay. 101 is the name of this session. This could end up like R101, uh, which uh, crashed in 1930, sadly. So, fingers crossed. Okay, so here we go. Um, so we're just going to load up the modeling tool. I'm going to stand at the other side because it's easier. Load up the modeling tool. Again, don't worry if you can't see the details. This is just to give you a flavor of what's happening. So here is a, a template. Okay, It's the whole document. Remember, Tom, I was just saying this is a use case document. And it's made up of a number of archetypes. First, we have a big one at the top called the Reasonable Adjustment Summary. And inside that, we've got a component called Reasonable Adjustment. That was one that we built specifically for this use case. Right? It's a UK specific use case, not from the international community. But we also need something called presenting needs. And we already have, so Hilde, if you could add it in, we already have a good can candidate from one of these international open source repositories of an existing archetype called problem diagnosis, which happens to fit quite nicely for this use case. Oh, that went well. Sorry, I stayed logged on for too, I was logged oh, right. on for too long. Overprepared. All right. So for, first thing we're going to do, um, yeah, just take out the. We're going, to, we're going to remove a couple of items that are in there already just to make the demo go faster. We're going to add this problem diagnosis archetype to the template. Okay, here it comes. I'll just scroll that up a bit, Lee. Okay, and then open up data, and we can see there's a whole bunch of names. So remember, Tomas was saying, you know, we deliberately create these archetypes to be this kind of maximal data set everything that might possibly go into a problem diagnosis uh, uh, model will be in there. But we don't need most of these things for this use case. All we really need is the name of the diagnosis, um, a comment, uh, and a, a date. So we're going to what we call constrain these things out. So, Hilde, if you could just constrain them out. Do you want the date onset in there? Uh, no, take, no, leave that out. It's a different date we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to prohibit all, right? So they're still formally, formally part of the archetype, but they're not part of the template because they're not of interest to the clinicians and they're certainly not of, the in of interest to any developers that come across this. We're going to change that to presenting need name because that's what the local, the, 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 the local use case is. It is a kind of problem, but in the context of the problem that <coughs> about um, reasonable adjustment summary. Okay, so go down to protocol now, and under there, there is last updated, so that's good, we want to keep that in. And we'll also change comment to um, additional notes, because again, that's what it says in the requirements, right? So we're adapting the template to more closely match the published requirements that have come from NHS Digital. Again, makes it easier, doesn't affect the semantics, doesn't affect the querying, but it makes it easier for people to line things up, understand how it's working the requirements. Okay, um, we will make one other change. Okay, so if we go up to the 
a reasonable adjustment uh, summary itself, we're going to add in, so this is an existing architect, we're going to change it. So we're going to add in a new data point. We'll put in a date of, um, uh, just let's put in a date, um, date updated, last updated. I can't see the date either. <laughs> yeah, just press the press the plus button and we can get it from there. Sorry? I can't see the date either. Report a bug. No, nah, just don't, don't let, let's not bother about date because it will get confusing. Okay, so let's add uh, a, a, a boolean. All right. Oh, you added a text. So we'll put in um, Category, right? One of the uh, sorry, one of the data points that's that's missing from this is a category, which would probably come from a SNOMED, SNOMED uh, representation in the real world. So we can add data data items, add ad adjust these models very very quickly. We'll now save that. We will reload it into the uh, into the template, and we've now got category there. All right. This is the kind of modelling work that Hildy and I would do regularly for a number of different clients, including people like Eurotransplant, City in Moscow, this is what we do. We help people build these models, train them to do it themselves in due course. Okay, next, we export that in what's called an operational template. This is a big XML file, which effectively is what we load up into the CDR. All right, so our modeling work is done. We're now handing this effectively to the data repository. And this is where we jump into this next tool. Uh, this is the CDR viewer, if you like, EHR Explorer. Right, so just load up that model building. I can see it here. Hang on, I'm just... This is so small I can't see. That's <laughs> <laughs> it. So. So system's just resetting itself. Now this repository doesn't know anything about reasonable adjustments. This is a completely new bit of data as far as it's concerned. But we're not having to send this to an engineer and ask them to refactor the database. We're not sending it to a logical modeler to say, how does this work out? We've done all that work already. In fact, there is no refactoring in the database at all. It's not even happening automatically. The data stores are actually static. Is it coming? Okay. Keep talking. <laughs> I don't know how many times we tested this earlier. But, uh, yeah, it never works. Yeah. Just go go back out and log in again. So what we're doing? That, any questions of what you've seen so far? So it's all, it, it is deliberately a bit of a rush because we want to show you just how fast people who know how to do this can, can make these changes. So one of, the, one of the things people say is, well, where do you get the archetypes from? So typically in a project, something like 70% will come from the international repository. Maybe another 20% will come from a national repository, like the ones that uh, Norway are building and you know, Aperta are joint funding with NHS Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and, and, and English funding to do one for the UK. So we'll be putting this model up into this repository uh, probably <coughs> later on next week and people can start using it. We could use it in Plymouth you know, next week. Reasonable adjustments. Andy, you're going to need to do some unreasonable adjustments. Your archetype is ready for you, sir. <laughs> You've never tested it on Southwest Broadband? We did. We <laughs> tested it this morning on Southwest Broadband. <laughs> that is weird. You didn't any or in your yeah, we didn't. That was ah. There we go. Yes, yes. We have a we have. It doesn't normally take anything like as well. Okay, so let's just open up. We'll go back into query, will we? Query. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and we, if you open up the navigator, we should see the, the new template, and we'll, oh, here it is. Reasonable adjustment, just open it up there. It's in the recent. Sorry, sorry. Under, under recent. <laughs> and you'll see this, here's this template, okay, and down here we've got the problem diagnosis with the name presenting need. 
uh, additional notes and last updated. And there we've got the new category there. Now we've done a very simple one, adding dates, you could, uh, sorry, adding text. We could have coded text, numericals, quantities, any kind of data type you need and have. All right, now we've got our uh, effectively our template, our new data model registered with the CDR. Now we're going to build one of these little forms. Okay, yeah, just pull it in, drag it in. Because this is all structured data, the knowledge of the data structures are carried in the template that you can see there. So it allows this kind of GUI builder. Now, you know, this ain't pretty. It's pretty nice, but you know, it's not high quality, you know, GUI. You know, this is used a lot for prototyping. Some people use it for quick and dirty forms, but in general, people will use other technologies to really tidy it up or use this as a start point. So we've got, you know, our uh, basic data items there. Let's just let's just build it, Hildy. Let's just run it. So we'll I save changed, it. I have changed the status to ready buttons. Okay, that's fine. So do a save. We've now created our form definition. And we will go and run that form now. So what we're now doing is actually running that form against the backend data store. Right? This is essentially live data now. All right, so reasonable adjustment, status active, reasonable adjustment. See, it's got that data. That's, those drop-down values are actually encoded in, in the original archetype. So we're capturing that knowledge directly from clinicians, and then it can be reused by technology. So physical disability, learning disability, ignore reason for removal, put in category uh, disability or something like that. It doesn't really matter. Presenting need, put in something like communication difficulties. <coughs> and then put in today's date for last updated. Okay, that was it. All right, so submit now down at the bottom. Okay, and what it's doing is it's asking which patient to assign this to. The EHR ID is the internal identifier that an open air system uses. We're just saying, give it to that particular patient and save it. Bang. No error messages. Now, if we put in something that wasn't legal, again, Tomás just saying there's validation here. If we put in a data value that, that wasn't valid, we would get uh, two validation errors. First of all, we definitely get it when it hits the server, because it does server-side validation. But this, this little form builder tool also uses the validation rules inside the template to do some UI-side validation as well. And typically, that's what most developers would do. All right, so the final bit of this is to do a bit of querying. Right, so again, all of the querying in an open air system is based on the templates and archetypes. It's not based on the physical data models that are inside the system. Under here is, is a set of Postgres SQL tables, I believe. But I don't have to know. I don't have to get anywhere near that. So what we're going to do is just uh, use this, this um, part of the, the explorer lets us that create these queries. But fundamentally, the, the AQL, the archetype query language, is like a weird mix of SQL and XPath, because uh, data in a, an open air system is very much path-based. Right, so if you just double click that, and we're going to pull back, you know, don't worry about the details here, but we're going to pull back all the data allocated to composition, reasonable adjustment summary, right? All effectively a document level. So execute that. It brings it back. You can see there's our test version from this morning. Uh, we were trying to, <laughs> so we, we tell we have tested it. And that says, the first item says sensory disability. That was the one we tested. There's our learning disability. Just scroll along a little bit. Um, you know, just to, yeah, that's it. Okay, there's a lot of data here, right? So that's just captured all that data. It's completely new. Right? Wasn't, didn't know about this before. So effectively, we've managed to create a model, save the data, query the data, build a form. That's pulling back the whole document. But we could say, so just take that out, Hildy, take out the, the, the AQL, and just click on problem diagnosis uh, presenting need value. Yeah, that'll do. 
double click on that, all right, and execute. And all we're getting back here is something different. We're just getting one data point from this big data tree. We're just getting the name of the diagnosis, the problem diagnosis. And what's happened? We've got a whole bunch of things coming back. We've got ulcerative colitis. We've got chronic back pain. Why is that? That's because that problem diagnosis archetype has been used in different places in the system. And we've just said, give me all the problems and diagnosis back. We don't care where they live. And of course, that's kind of extreme and probably not all that helpful. But in a real health system, you have to be able to say, you know, control the context. Just give me back the reasonable adjustments problem diagnosis. Or give me the renal problem diagnosis. Or give me the GP problem diagnosis. And open air lets you do that because of the richness of the querying language. You can control the context of, of, of the data use. And that, I think, is that. So, any questions? you number two. <laughs> Hi there, Leila Shepard, Digital McKinsey. First of all, kudos for doing a live demo, that was amazing. We, we um, secondly, you touched on the point that you could, for example, for example, load that template to a repository. Yep. Um, how would someone like Andy, wanting to bring in reasonable adjustments, um, choose that particular version over other templates that other people might have developed in parallel and, and uploaded? That's governance, all right? So part of this, and we'll probably talk about it a little in the workshops, is you have to have a way of managing this. It's actually a, familiar, it's a problem that we're also struggling with in the, in the fire community, and it's something we should probably definitely cooperate on, is this management of these open shared artefacts is quite a, a challenging thing to do. Uh, but it is about having these things visible, so putting them up, up in repositories, encouraging people to put these things up fast so that we don't get two parallel streams of activity. Make it visible and talk to each other. And ultimately, it will be about someone saying, no, we think this is the best one to use. So one of the things we've done in the Aperta CKM community is to publish what we call a set of opinionated templates. We're not saying you have to use them, but we think they're damn good. And we've talked to the guys in, in, in public to make sure that they fit. Now, you know, people ultimately will decide what combination of things they want to use. But if we can guide them, probably not force them if, if we can avoid it. And then you can build value add on top of that. So what we've done with those templates is then to build fire connectors. Because we've got a consistent data model and consistent target, we can then build fire connectors, which we made open source. And that's the value of this ecosystem. Take one question here. Hi, Robin Breslin from Forker. Yes, brilliant demonstration. Really uh, brave to do that as well. I've, I've got a, a sort of associated question. I see the method to build up a solution, but the method to structure the repository. How do you implement a solution, let's say, um, that serves a population of 5.5 million like Scotland? How do you put the infrastructure? How do you make sure that you're able to service all of those API calls that, that will call in on the system? Do you mean at a, techni at a technical mm. layer? Yeah, yeah. Tomaj is the man to answer. <laughs> we know it can be done, all right? There is some clever technology here. You know, people often say, I often get asked the question, Ian, can you tell our company how to build a CDR? We really love this idea, but we want to do our own. And I say, don't. Just don't do it. Go and buy or use someone else's. You know, there are some open source examples. So all of, all of the stuff we've done here, we could equally have done with Ethersys, the, the open source version. I mean, Miranda being very generous in allowing us to effectively clone some of the APIs that they're using. Um, but to get it to scale of you know, 10 and a half million patients or 250 Brazilian patients, that needs serious engineering. You don't do that out of the box. You learn how to use it. And then if you've got the engineering team who think they can do it, yet then you let them loose two or three thousand years down the road. And that's effectively what you did. Yeah. Yeah. So just to give you an idea, Moscow City is running this for 130,000 users, 12 million patients, and about four terabytes of data now. So uh, Brazil is going to be much bigger. But you can, uh, there's several technologies. You can shard, you can uh, you know, cluster, you can, actually the, the uh, OpenEHR approach is actually really easy to, to shard, to have many servers, as many as you need to vertically uh, and horizontally scale. I'm sure That's the guys will be happy to pick up yeah. this afternoon, yeah, we, we can talk if you want to talk, talk in data. 
We've got all the right people here. Thank you very much. We're running a bit late. Would, is it can something we can like pick up? I just emphasise one thing, and that's the importance of the governance. Mm -hmm. Because that, what that does is start the process that you have to go through if you, for instance, want to bring together data from different sources. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly important thing, mm -hmm. and it's, it's vital that you don't skip it or try and mm -hmm. yeah, yes. not do it thoroughly. Good point. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ian. And Hildy. <laughs>